museum is the United States Holocaust Memorial in Washington, dedicated to never letting genocide happen again. It now finds itself with fresh evidence in a new exhibit. And what is this? The teacher would use this just to teach the alphabet. It's the ABCs. Yeah, ABCs of Arabic. John Prendergast brought these remains from Jacob's Village here and to the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles. In the Clinton White House, he led a team that imposed economic sanctions on Sudan. Now, he's with the private International Crisis Group, pressing for action in Darfur. We found in a book bag a series of notebooks. Clearly, the kid who was doing math and, and, and spelling uh, homework, and the, and the teacher has corrected it with a red pen. The kid, Jacob, must have been 16 when his village was destroyed. We packed his books and left on a journey of 7,000 miles. One reason the Sudanese government is getting away with murder is that the scene of the crime is about as far away as a place can be. We hired a bush plane to drop us in Chad along the Sudan border. There's no runway, just rocks marking a strip in the Sahara. There are no roads either. We crossed with Jacob's books during the rainy season when all the rain of the year falls in just a few weeks. But this wasn't the hard part. Our problem was Jacob's story starts in a place we were forbidden to go. Darfur is occupied by government troops. Jacob's town, Hangala, is 50 miles inside. The U.S. State Department warned us not to try to go there. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu if we could get to Hengala, these men could help. They're rebels who call themselves the National Redemption Front. It's their families who are being massacred. They agreed to give us cover to Hengala. That's it. That's the border. We've just crossed from Chad heading into Sudan and into Darfur. We asked the Sudanese government for permission to come into Darfur, but we didn't get it. No surprise. The Sudanese have been trying to keep reporters and other observers out of this area. They've intensified that effort lately. In just the last few weeks, two journalists have been captured making this run. You can look at it this way. Back in 1944, the Germans didn't want anybody coming in and seeing their death camps. And today in Sudan, the government doesn't want anybody coming in and seeing what amount to death villages. It's a five-hour trip, but in the rainy season, the gun trucks sank to their axles. We dug them out. And did it again every hour or so. In time, we picked up speed, and it was a good thing. Five hours turned to 12. By the time we reached Angala, there were just 45 minutes of daylight left. The rebels put scouts on the high ground and surrounded the village. This is a picture of Hangala before the attack, as Jacob might remember it. This is what the government didn't want us to see. How many people were living here at the time it was attacked? 500 people. 500, and there are houses all around us, as far as the eye can see, and they're all destroyed, every single one of them. Why burn each and every house down? Yeah, it's a message, you know. It's, it's, a, it's a message to non-Arab people in Darfur. We do not want you in Darfur. A message delivered by Sudanese troops and a racist Arab militia called the Janjaweed. How would this attack have, have played out on the day that it happened here? Yeah. Five in the morning, people were woken up by the sound of aerial bombardment. And then the Janjaweed, the, the armed militiamen, come in on camelback and horseback and they start burning and shooting the men, raping the women. And then the third phase is the government forces, usually on the outskirts, cleaning up anybody who tries to escape. How many villages like this have been destroyed in this way? Hundreds and hundreds of villages all throughout Darfur. We now have over two million people, about two and a quarter million people who are homeless. These are pictures of the killing, taken by an international military observer. Survivors took children and ran an exodus without food or shelter, until they came here. Beyond the shimmer of the Sahara, you'll find a refugee camp, Ori Kasoni, a warehouse for a persecuted people. If Jacob was alive, he'd be in a place like this. The camp was set up by the UN and an American charity, the International Rescue Committee, started in the 1930s to rescue Jews in Germany. 
Why are these people targets of genocide today? Because they're not Arabs. Sudan's government is an Arab dictatorship. Ethnic Africans have suffered discrimination for years, and when they rebelled in 2003, the government moved to exterminate them. Kids pay the price for their parents' wars, and there are nearly 20,000 children in this camp alone. Zara, seven. Mahmoud, two. Monir and Osman, three, are among the orphans. Grandma Hadid packed them onto a donkey and walked three days. How many members of your family were killed? From the same family, we are 28 that were killed. What happened to their parents? His mother died. The bomb that was dropped from the plane cut her to pieces, and she died instantly. But the father was killed by the gingerbread. Now, this child is, is, a, is still a mystery. There were more children in the clinic. Ashish Brahma is the camp doctor, one doctor for 25,000 people. So we have very simple drugs here, but I'm doing funky medicine or voodoo medicine or bush medicine. I'm doing what we can here with the medicine we have without the equipment. So we met a starving child, framed like a picture against that vibrant culture that used to be, with little certainty of a future. Dr. Brahma was hopeful for this girl, suffering with meningitis, but she died in just a few hours. What is it that you think people don't understand about what's going on here now? If I'm really honest, please, this is bad. They go to the villages, then they burn one village after the other. Then when the people come out, they catch the women and they gangbang, they rape them. Not one guy, no, 10, 15. And then they carve up the men and throw them in the drinking water. So to make sure that this place will never, ever be used again. And you're telling me that the people in America don't know this or don't want to know this? Maybe it's too much to know. But that's what's happening right now. And it's happening all over again. I'm sorry to say, I'm going to sit here with you in two years' time. I'm going to tell you the same sad story. People will say, Habes nicht gewusst, which is German for, I didn't know. The man who doesn't want you to know is Sudan's dictator, Omar al-Bashir. Five months ago, he signed a U.S.-brokered peace agreement, but it never took hold. Al-Bashir launched a new offensive, and then last month came to the U.N., to hear President Bush say this to his face. To the people of Darfur, you have suffered unspeakable violence. And my nation has called these atrocities what they are, genocide. Sudan's UN representative up on the right looked amused. Al-Bashir on the left threatened war against UN peacekeepers. Why do these guys mock the U.S. in public? Well, it turns out our government's relationship with Sudan is complicated. In the 1990s, al-Bashir hosted Osama bin Laden for five years. So he has information on al-Qaeda. It's been a, a very good deal for the government of Sudan to give little tidbits of information about suspects around the world in order to blunt uh, the United States' outrage over what's happening in Darfur. Last year, the U.S. sent a private jet to bring Sudan's intelligence chief to CIA headquarters. This is the same guy who was the architect of the counterinsurgency strategy in Darfur. What kind of signal does that send to the government of Sudan? Look, this is a hard thing to swallow because what you're saying is the United States is in bed with the government in Khartoum on counterterrorism issues, and therefore we're looking the other way on a genocide. I mean, that's tough. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's really a uh, heinous arrangement and one that uh, history will judge very harshly. To be fair, two administration officials told us that the intelligence gain has been substantial, and at the same time, the White House has been pressing hard for peacekeepers. One official said we expect al-Bashir to do both. The Bush administration was first to call the killing genocide, and it's keeping refugees alive with half a billion dollars of relief a year. Our journey to find Jacob brought us to the Oracusoni camp because UN records showed that someone by the same name applied for a ration card here years ago. The people of Hengala were now in a place called Zone C. So, nearly three years after they were left in the ruins, we brought the books to Hengala's teachers. So, 
does he recognize his name? No, no. I was his teacher. I taught him. You you were his teacher. I want. He's one of the the best students. Can you take us to see him? Yes, it is possible. Let's see him. Jacob? Hello. I am Scott. This is John. Good to see you. Sit down. We want to show you something. He says, where do you find these things? In Hangala. 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 All of this is mine. He's 19 now. Been in the camp two years. What happened to you the day the village was attacked? The Janjaweed, aided by government troops, attacked and burned the village. What happened to the other members of your family? Some of them were killed and some of them ran away. We don't even know where they are right now. We noticed how calmly he told the story. It's a strength of his tough desert tribe. And besides, he told us, the horrors too fresh to dwell on. Because we are disturbed. Everybody is, is, is disturbed. We, we couldn't think straight. So we never got the chance to sit together and to think of whom we have lost and who is still there and, and our life before. And remember the ABCs we found in the museum? What is that? This belongs to my younger brother. What happened to your brother? He was scared of the bombing. And when the Janjaweed attacked, he ran. Nonetheless, he was, was killed. And how old was your brother? Well, almost four years. Four years old. He never had a chance to have a school book. He never even entered school yet. Jacob was glad to see his books again, but he asked us to take them back to the museums, as he put it, for the whole world to see. We took the books, but we left Jacob as he was, one of more than two million refugees who can't go home and have no future here. As we headed out, Sudan's government had launched its new offensive in this African Holocaust, what may be its final solution for the people of Darfur.